from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, everybody. Hi, uh, my name is David Plyler. It's a uh, great pleasure to see you all here. Um, I, I'm a music specialist at the Library of Congress. I'm also a composer and a pianist, so that's my background. My biggest regret of the evening, and I hope it remains as such, is my inability to come up with a really catchy title for this talk. Um, motive Cello. Does anybody have an idea what that might be referring to? I'll give you a clue. We're in the Jefferson Building. Thank you. Okay, so, so, so it is supposed to be a Monticello reference, but um, <laughs> I fell very short on this one, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to take a, a sort of a, a little bit more of a technical approach to the uh, talk tonight, uh, but not hopefully an overwhelming one at all. Um, we have three really interesting and quite divergent types of pieces that are going to be performed tonight, and you're in for a real treat uh, with some great performers. Um, the first piece is the Beethoven, uh, the fourth cello sonata, which is a very compact uh, uh, piece. Um, and it's actually what I'll be spending most of the time talking about because there's quite a bit to unpack in it. Um, then we have the Brahms second cello sonata, uh, which we will also address. And then uh, kind of a rarely heard piece, the Chopin cello sonata. And so I'll, I'll say a little bit about each one, but you can read a bit more about the historical background in the, in the notes uh, when you have them. Um, so I'd like to just dive right in to uh, looking at how Beethoven approaches the C major cello sonata. So for our opening gambit, I just kind of put out there what, what he gives us, which is basically a cello solo with a piano answer. And you can see right there, so the cello is by itself and the piano answers. There are certain types of relationships in here that are what you'd say absolutely characteristic of Beethoven. And in fact, if you look um, at his earliest works, I'm thinking in particular of the Opus II, uh, number one piano sonata, the F minor, you can see the same exact things happening in those early works up to this work, which was composed in about 1815. The approaches, I'll make a little bit clearer, but I just want to, before I go into the analytical part of it, I just want to say that these are just options of how to look at this music. This is not the way, or I'm not trying to dictate a particular stance on it. It's just one way that I'm putting out there. So it's just, it just helps me to get to know the music a bit better. So we'll take a closer look at a few of these ideas. Um, there are certain ideas that come back again and again throughout this sonata. Um, I've labeled them A, B, and C. Those are the big ones. And then A.1 and B.1, those are kind of subsidiary ideas that are contained. A.1 is within A, and B.1 is within B. And the N, that stands for neighbor. And that will have a, a make, make a, those, those notes get along well. Um, so those, uh, that relationship will come into play a bit later. But these are things that we, uh, we can hear very clearly. Once A is a descending scale, B has uh, basically outlines a triad. And um, by the way, this is in a tenor clef. So that first note is a C, um, if, if you're not familiar with that clef. Um, B outlines a major triad. And then C is just kind of a following figure that keeps coming back. And it's, it's melodically very clear when you hear it. Um, so let's look at this by extension into the piano part as well. Um, that top part is what you just saw in the last slide. 
But then we have some different things happening already, some manipulations happening to the music in the piano part. And I know that the way that I have labeled it might kind of obscure it a bit, but all I really mean to say is, for instance, we have on the top in the center, and the, the first thing you see in the right hand of the piano part is A.1i. And all I mean by that is that little tidbit that we have up here in the cello line of A.1, it's inverted. It's upside down. So Beethoven starts with that little idea. I didn't call it A because he doesn't go to the E. So that's why I call it A.1i. Again, there's not going to be a quiz on this or anything, but this is just to give you a, a sense of this. Um, we have C is echoing what we just heard in the cello. We have an echo of that in the piano right after we hear it in the cello. So it creates a very clear sonic relationship between those two ideas. Um, we have another neighbor tone. We have um, B.1 that's augmented, inverted, and references the rhythm. Um, and this is the B.1A, which is basically B.1 stretched out a little bit and creating a different type of rhythm. And so why do I mention these things here? Why are these variations already here? If you were just to complete, if you were just to repeat the same thing over and over again, we wouldn't have uh, the most interesting piece of music. It might be a great piece of music, but um, for Beethoven, he really is all about the process of development. And he tends to do that right away. And so that development process can be quite simple in its local levels. Like there's not something crazy, difficult to understand manipulations. You're just turning something upside down or stretching it out. But in total, it, when they're put together, it can become quite complicated. Um, and when it's done well, then you have a piece that you enjoy listening to. <laughs> Uh, which is what I think Beethoven achieved, which is why we're hearing it tonight, and the artists have chosen it. Um, so we'll move on. Now, what I just said, I'm going to take back one, one thing I just said, which is that he can't repeat something without it being interesting. Well, of course, that's not true, um, because he does it right away in the same exact piece that I'm referencing. If you look at the top uh, image, you have the piano part, and measure 6 through 10. And just the very top line, starting with that G, if you follow that line, you'll see that the same exact melody is repeated verbatim in the cello part, starting right after that moment, that after, after the piano finishes that phrase. So that's starting again, it's in the tenor clef. Um, I probably should have just put it in the treble clef, but that starts on a G. And it's the same thing, just an octave lower. But what makes it different, and when you're listening tonight in the concert, it won't strike you as, oh, there he goes again with just the same old thing, you know, repeating it for us or right away. Harmonically, it's different, and he also puts different types of material with it, so that it's always in the sense of, uh, you always feel like you're in familiar territory, but it's also always changing. The next thing I want to mention is this idea of how he, Beethoven ends things. And I call these termination clauses. I'm trying to be cute, I guess. Um, but the, uh, what we find is that uh, this is just the right hand part of the piano that we just saw. Um, he has these little figures that kind of go around a note. In this case, that first one marked X, it's going around F. And then the second one, marked X, it's going around C. So that last one, it's B, D, C. It's just a way of terminating on a note that's in the center of two pitches on either side of that note. Um, what we also have, where I have labeled end, is kind of an ending figure. Um, in this case, it happens to be located close to a half cadence. So it has the feeling of actually being an ending. But what Beethoven does is he starts to play with those expectations and truncate the length of the phrases between, uh, between these uh, examples of these end type phrases. So here we have, um, just a little bit later, this is measures 14 through 16. We see that same basic, you, can, you don't even have to know the pitches, you can just follow the contours 
of the notes where it's marked end, end, and an end. Not end, but end. Um, and those ones, you can see that they start to become stacked right next to each other. So they no longer have that termination feature to them. They've been reinterpreted and they have more of a kind of thematic motto-like quality to them. I won't have time to go into this today, but this has actually a big effect on the entire piece. Um, but I'll, what I'll mention about it is that uh, Beethoven destabilizes where the end of a phrase is to the point where, um, what, where we would expect a final cadence doesn't occur in that proper spot until the very end of the piece. For about the last five or six measures, he finally gets it back in sync in the right way. So that's something to listen for. I don't know how audible it is. Uh, depends on how familiar you are with the piece, but um, it's, it's one of those things that he's playing with, definitely, as he goes. You'll notice that I'm also including more of those neighbor tones, those are those N, marked N, and also more of those X, X kind of figures. So now I'd like to just move on to a problem with, the, with talking about mo motives and ideas that are related. What exactly makes something related? If you have a scale and you have another, you know, or a triad or something like that that you hear in all classical period music, is it, is it something that you if, would feel comfortable with calling that a meaningful motive that has a lot of information in it? The answer is probably not, or at least we have to be very clear about what type of criteria we use to determine whether something is um, a motive or not. And the thing is, is that people have different opinions about this. On the same pieces, I'll write papers about how, no, that such and such is wrong about this or that. Um, and really what it is, well, you have to just find places, the, the, you have to find meaning and see if there is meaning for you when you're analyzing. Um, and one of the biggest problems you have is the half step, um, uh, resolving half step idea where it's kind of a, it's always given a lamentoso feeling and people will say, oh, this has the, the, this sort of an affect to it. And sometimes it's very traceable, like if you're looking at the music of Purcell or somebody like that. But at other points, it's just because they're in a minor mode and it has a flat six or something like that. So it might be not the most meaningful aspect of the motiv mot motivic component. In this case, though, I'm going to just go ahead and put it out there that that X component that I've already mentioned continues to have a role in the second uh, thematic area. Now, this sonata is structured in a very strange way. It's basically two movements. It's written as two movements, but it's and another way of looking at it is a sequence of about five movements. So it has a, a, an, an andante introduction, and then we get to a very fast, uh, very different kind of music, and this is part of that um, right afterwards, uh, but, but it's juxtaposed with it. So there's no uh, break in the actual, uh, there's no silence between these movements, and so it's still part of movement one. Then that goes for about a good five minutes, then we have the first structural break, where there's a double bar. And then we move to a slow movement, which elides to another reference to the beginning of the material. So it has two other different tempo areas. And then finally, another fast area to finish it. So while on paper it looks like two movements, it really has these five main sections. Um, in any case, what all else, else I'll say about this is that these things that I've identified as X and Y, by the time we get to the, that referral back to the original material, Beethoven has combined them so that they are integrated in a compelling way. And you can argue about, um, there are certain aspects of Y in particular that would come up in lots of minor mode music, but there seems to be a deliberateness in what he's doing, to me at least. Um, going back to those neighbor tones, and I said that they would become more important later. Um, we start to see this process of oscillation. And what I mean by that is kind of a rocking back and forth 
between uh, different notes and different ideas. So the things marked N down the bottom, it's basically oscillating between whole steps and half steps. Um, and it's punctuated very clearly with forte piano marking, so very strong attacks. I won't really get into the X variants, but there are those, I'll just say this, there are those still those kind of wedge ideas that keep cropping up. Eventually, you start to see the oscillations widening. And um, you'll hear this. It's not just you know, in my head here. You'll, you'll hear this because he accents them. And it's a very distinct effect. There's like this moment where you feel like you're in a harmonic stasis and, uh, uh, before moving on. And so it's a really um, effective type of development of this neighbor tone idea over time. So it's not just melodic. It also has these sorts of harmonic um, effects as well. Um, and then you can see that he's also varying the end idea that I showed earlier. So going back to our initial idea that I, I put up there, which was the opening cello solo. Um, this, let this one example stand for many in that uh, Beethoven continues to come back to the C idea in particular and variants of A um, throughout the entire uh, sonata. And so this, for instance, this one um, is a secondary theme in the fast section uh, down at the bottom. So it's, it's no longer in that introduction. So it's, out of, it's in a different context and it has a different meaning, but it's audible to the ear. <laughs> then what he does is that little A variant that I put there, um, he turns that into its, it has its own life to it afterwards. And this is something, again, you'll see in um, lots of composers, but in particular, you'll see it in the Beethoven and the Brahms tonight, um, a little bit in the Chopin too, but mostly in the Beethoven and the Brahms, especially in the Beethoven, where he'll take an idea, vary it, and then that becomes the core idea. So it's like it's replaced that original idea, and now there's going to be some sort of variation on that. And you can see how there's a relationship there between uh, the top one marked A variant and then the bottom three A variants. Um, at least I see that, and, and I hear it too. So another type of motivic manipulation that Beethoven uses, and by extension, lots of other composers too, um, is the idea of the teaser. So he'll have an idea that seems innocuous at first. So in this case, what I'm looking at is not so much that seventh, but the, the B, C sharp, D sharp, E. This idea, it seems like it's just kind of resolving up, but then he does it again, and he actually then moves away from it for a while, and we don't hear it, um, except it starts to crop up here and there melodically. Um, one might, if this is your only chance to ever hear this piece and it's the first time that you've heard it, you might then, upon hearing this motive in its isolated form, think, oh, this is actually quite familiar to me somehow, not quite sure how, um, but Beethoven was sure <laughs> because he prepared you for it. Um, and that was something that, uh, I, who knows whether this is an instinctual type of thing or uh, something that is planned. Different composers do it in different ways, um, but it's certainly there to be found or ignored, depending on how, what your analytical stance is. Um, so how he uses this is kind of funny, because when he gets to the uh, last section, um, this idea, now you can see it in its isolation, that rising scale, which again is just a, an inversion of that descending scale from the very beginning of the piece. Um, it starts in the piano, and then it gets echoed, or the cello takes the top note. Then the cello does it, and then the piano takes the top notes. And then the piano starts going on with a theme, and the cello gets off by an eighth note. So you can see that the cello is an eighth note early. <laughs> um, and it takes some time. It eventually gets back into sync. But over time, um, it gets out of sync again. And so this is something that Beethoven has a very good time. I imagine that he's having fun doing this and causing problems for the players, too, um, as he's doing this. Um, 
Let me get to um, precedents for this type of uh, material. Um, Opus 90, the piano sonata in E minor, um, dates from uh, 1814. Um, so I apologize for the clash of the titans. Um, but what happens <laughs> if you're playing this part that comes at the end of this uh, large build, uh, you can see that there's a very clear idea, which is just kind of a, a turn, a scale that comes back up at the end. It then gets stretched out farther and farther, and then it starts to compress again. Um, nothing really complicated about it, except when you get down to the bottom, where it says uh, the, the two Ps, you start to have the hands playing on top of each other. So you notice that there's a G, and then there's a G in the left hand on top, top of an F sharp going to an E. And so this causes, it's kind of a funny moment if you're playing the piece, because it's, it sounds very interesting, but it sounds like it really should be a duet for another a pair of instruments. It's really strange, it's a strange moment in this piece. And if you don't know the piece, uh, it's a great, uh, also a two movement sonata um, that's quite compact. Um, so this is, this is 1814, we skip ahead again to 1815, um, and we have some very funny moments that come in this sonata. Um, so what you'll hear is the, the cello kind of plays a drone-like uh, uh, dyad. Um, a few times this happens throughout the movement. Um, and then the piano enters with the, the idea that we just talked about, and then the cello tries to catch up. And it, it does it several times in a row, and it just it has the effect. It has, to me, it's a very comical effect, and I, I think it's done in jest, but it's a, it's a nice effect for sure. And again, it, it plays with this idea of getting back on the beat as one of the dramatic uh, imperatives of the whole piece, is just, just getting these things to come together by the very end. OK. so. That's what I'm going to say about the Beethoven for now. And I'm going to skip ahead to the Brahms and the Chopin. Uh, I'll say a little bit less about them in terms of just the, um, the more detailed within the piece kinds of uh, statements um, for two reasons. Well, one is I don't have much time, uh, but another one is that the Beethoven was really about kind of an introverted approach to looking at music. So that's uh, referencing within the piece. The Brahms, you can also do that, and you can also do that with the Chopin. But to me, the Brahms has also a, a very extroverted sort of uh, aspect to it. And I'll mention just a few things like that, uh, how, what I mean by that. So if we look at the very opening of it, and this is the opening of the um, of the cello sonata. And this dates from about 1886. This is Brahms' second. We see this kind of big tremolando sound. Uh, it does say piano, but most pianists do a very loud sforzando on the opening, and then they're still pretty loud. Uh, they keep it going because they get excited, or you know, I don't know. But the, um, the cello comes in with this very uh, kind of heroic theme that goes all over the place in terms of uh, tessitura and range. Um, but this struck me as very reminiscent, or rather prefiguring, another famous tremolando opening of Brahms. And that's the, I think I have this set up right. Yes, Tremolandus II, um, which is the G major string quintet, um, Opus 111, which dates from about, I think, five or six years later. Um, what's interesting about these is that the cello plays the inverted role <laughs> as far as the um, thematic material is concerned. It quickly deviates, but you have the, tr the tremolos in the upper strings, and the, the cello starts with the fourth that goes down. If we go back to look at this, we have the fourth that goes up in the cello. Um, so there's this, they, they feel like they're from the same sound world. Um, OK, maybe, maybe not. Well, it certainly wasn't from the same sound world at this time, because he hadn't written the string quintet yet. So there are some other interesting references that Brahms is making, though, both to his own music and to the music of others. Um, when we look at the beginning of the slow movement, 
of the Brahms. Does anybody notice anything strange about this movement um, from what you see here? And I'll just say again that this is the, the Brahms Sonata in F major. <laughs> yes, thank you, yeah. So it's, it's in F sharp, which is a little odd to say the least. Um, in fact, there are, is some evidence, and I'm not sure, uh, I, I don't know for sure about it, but there's some compelling evidence that this was actually intended to be part of his uh, first cello sonata, which was his in E minor. And, um, but it wouldn't have been in F sharp, it would have been in F. Um, and the reason that's, what's interesting about this is that there's a point in the middle of the, piece, in the, middle of the movement where it goes into F minor. And if you just transpose down a half step, you have F to E, so, which is going to be a much simpler uh, key scheme in terms of <laughs> you know, having to count a certain number of sharps and flats and whatnot. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, and I, it was, it's been posited, and there's some decent evidence for it, that this would have been potentially part of that earlier cello sonata, which was written about 20 years before, uh, before the second cello sonata. Um, but, Brahms felt that it was overloaded, and that original one has, uh, I think it's from 1865 or 66, has um, only three movements. So anyway, he uses it here, and he uses it to great effect, and it fits in with the rest of the piece, and there's all kinds of reasons why that it, it's clear that it does, and, um, and so it's not that he just kind of, you know, transported it over and, you know, willy-nilly and just let it be. Um, but what's interesting to me about this opening is that it feels like very much that it's referencing Beethoven, um, in particular, early Beethoven, uh, or at least a, a, a Beethovenian type of writing. And I'm speaking in particular of kind of a walking bass line. <laughs> and so if we look at, say, uh, the, the piano sonata in A major, the second, uh, opus two, number two, the uh, Largo movement, the second movement, um, you can see the same sort of bass line happening. Um, with the Brahms, it becomes quite clear that there's a bit more of a condensed uh, chromatic um, harmonic motion happening. But the Beethoven is also quite sophisticated if you, if you listen to this movement. And uh, so anyway, he's, he's very much referencing these, but what's, of course, the difference is that we have the cello uh, pizzicato that's providing that walking bass line at the beginning. So listen for that, and it's, it's, it's a very interesting effect, and it's really well done. Um, yeah, okay, so this is one of my favorite moments of the, of the piece. That's the, really the only reason I have a slide on it. Um, but this is, it is also an example of of a type of voice exchange that Brahms will do that very much like the Beethoven one that I showed before. So if we look at the cello line, that's an F sharp on the top, and we look two measures later, you'll find that F sharp in the bass. And you'll see the echo that it's, it's happening, but it has a very different effect on our ears because the first one is entirely melodic. We hear it that way. Um, and the second one also serves as the bass. So we're hearing it in a different way, but we also hear that melodically as well. So, um, so you'll, you'll, you'll hear this and, and enjoy it, I'm sure. Um, okay, another thing about, about Brahms is that, um, and li actually many, many great composers, especially people like Bach and whatnot, um, they, sometimes you just need some help. So it's usually okay if you're delving into your own works for that help, if uh, you might think about it. So um, this is the opening of the final movement of Brahms' third symphony, the Opus 90, which is written about three years prior to, uh, prior to the uh, composition of the cello sonata. Um, uh, yeah, you need to cite it if you are going to to steal, that was a bad one, but, um, <laughs> but the, the, you can actually see, because they're in the same key, if you follow 
the top line, he does his preference for sixths in the, um, as often he does in the piano part of the beginning of that, of the scherzo movement from the cello sonata in the bottom. If you follow that top line starting on C, you'll see a sort of outline of the first two measures of that symphonic component. Um, and um, if you hear these next to each other, it, it leaps out. But he very quickly moves on and it becomes, uh, takes them in two very different way, different paths. Um, so it's not like he's cheating that much. But speaking of cheating, um, <laughs> the the Chopin I, and I, uh, this work, I'll say just a little bit about it because it it's a strange piece for Chopin. He wrote it um, starting around 1845 to 1847 during that period. It's what, it's a piece that he struggled with. There are more worksheets for this piece, I believe, than for any other piece of Chopin, um, in terms of what he didn't save everything, uh, but. Um, he had a hard time with it, and he worked on it with a cellist friend who also uh, premiered it with him. Um, but prior to that, uh, he had not written, I think, uh, I think he hadn't, the last cello and piano piece he had written was 1831. So a good 15 years before, and in that time, he had only been writing uh, for almost completely solo piano music. Had Chopin not died at age of, of 39, um, I would really like to have seen where he would have gone if he had done more chamber music, because he only has a trio and then three pieces for um, cello and piano. There supposedly were some violin and piano pieces, but uh, nobody knows where they are. So um, we really only have four pieces uh, of chamber music by Chopin, um, which is a shame. This, and this piece is a very interesting one, because it sounds like there's so much going into it that at first it can be confusing, at least to me in the first movement, and it takes time for it to unravel, and it unravels in a very different way than the, Be the Beethoven or the Brahms, um, and in a very compelling way, I think, as well. Um, but one thing, since we're on the topic of stealing, um, I do want to mention the Largo movement from the Chopin Sonata. Um, if you'll just notice, I'll come back to the screen, the, the cello's melody, and just kind of let it sink in, and you'll, you'll hear it um, quite clearly uh, in a little bit. Um, then compare that to, this is the, um, the funeral march movement of uh, his second piano sonata, which was finished, I think, in um, 1837. And so uh, it predates by about eight, nine years uh, this Largo movement, if you were to basically take, it starts with an F, uh, G flat, F, E flat, B flat, A flat, if you were to skip the D flat and the C, you'd have the same uh, basic melodic line that you have in, in this one. Um, hearing them next, next to each other will help to make that clear, but um, it's, quite a different, uh, ends up being a different harmonic context, and uh, there's a bit more going on, but this is actually a much shorter movement. It's only about three and a half, four minutes um, in the cello sonata versus the funeral march movement from the piano sonata, which is a full eight and a half to nine minutes if you do the repeats. And then it also has, um, it's followed by that really brief uh, coda finale. Um, I think, lastly, what I'd like to say, other than cogito largo sum, um, is that the, the main points that I'm making are that there are these intertextual types of relationships that you can find within a piece. Um, and there are lots, many, many more than what I pointed out here. This is just a little bit of what I'm thinking. Um, intertextual. And these are ones where you can see relationships between pieces, uh, maybe even between styles of music. And then interesting textural, um, which would be in the Chopin, what I, and I, what I don't have time to show you, but what I'd like you to listen for, 
um, are certain types of piano figuration, for instance, that um, will kind of carry over from movement to movement. They're not exactly the same, but they serve a similar sonic function as a motive in that we, we start to hear them and they become, they develop in particular ways that are interesting. Um, I'll say one thing about that in the first movement of the Chopin. You'll have, um, the piano does a, an introduction, which is actually a statement of, um, kind of an abbreviated statement of the main theme, followed by this, this kind of strange, I think it's three bar, um, cadenza-like elaboration that feels out of place at first. And it's not until you get to the development section of the sonata that that takes on a whole life of its own. And it's, in fact, developed in a way that is a little bit similar to the way that, uh, say, Beethoven would develop a, a motive. But not so much in terms of inverting it and doing arpeggios down instead of up, but rather that it, it starts to have more of a thematic um, uh, meaning to it. Um, at this point, I'd like to thank you all for listening to me talk, and I think because we have a few minutes, and I'm happy to take any questions if you have, I think we have just a time for a couple of questions, if you have any. Um, I, just one moment, if you can wait for the microphone, that way we can keep it. And hopefully I'll have an answer. But. Thanks. I always feel like I'm taking up for Brahms. Um, but the stealing thing, don't you think, like, uh, for example, um, the opening to his first cello sonata and the opening to his fourth symphony. You get the inversion of the, of the triad. I mean, I think he gets into a certain world in, in these keys that I don't think is stealing as much as just his expression of that key. Those are the same keys, by the way, though. So it's E minor, first cello sonata, E minor symphony, right. uh, the fourth symphony. Um, yeah, and this is one of those things where it's a question of what, what you privilege as um, a meaningful motivic connection. Uh, absolutely, it's debatable. Um, I don't hear those as being as related as I do this scherzo movement to the, but again, it's a tenuous relationship. It's one that is going to come up time and again um, in many different contexts just because of the particular mode you're using, you know, all those types of things. So it's a good point uh, that it may not be meaningful. It may be just the analyst's choice to make it meaningful. Uh, the other thing is I read that, um, you know, Beethoven's a very late piece of Beethoven, the sonata. It's a, it's a late yeah. work. So at this point, he's throwing out sonata form, which he, you know, for early works, he's working with sonata form a la Haydn and Mozart. And by this time, he's throwing it out um, pretty much entirely. So this, I read this actually in, in um, a preface to a score just just today that yeah. he, uh, that he's just right now just saying what he's got to say and getting out. See, I would I, I would disagree with the idea of, of it being thrown out necessarily. I think what's happening is well, he's that, taken from it what he needs and yeah, you know. and uh, yeah, I think the thing to remember with um, forms is that um, you know, people don't uh, most composers that I know and I think composers uh, in this common practice time wouldn't sit down with like a form that they would a template that way they would then fill out and meet certain expectations with, with the exceptions of certain types of harmonicals that they might have. But you find that changing uh, from very early on. It's quite fluid, um, uh, especially in Beethoven, but he's Beethoven still working with Beethoven broke within, it up with the Eroica and... Yeah, and he's still, I mean, he's still working within the realm of sonata forms, though, um, in, in the piece that we're looking at tonight, too. Um, I th it just depends on, it's just a more fluid sense of it, especially like I, I mentioned at the beginning, that we now have this kind of um, five movement uh, kind of strangeness. See, like for instance, if you look at the Brahms, I'm trying to think of another five movement structure, even though it's two movements, um, Brahms opus um, five, the third piano sonata, um, that piece is in five, minute, five movements. And it has uh, this, what's called a rukblik, uh, look back um, kind of movement that is the penultimate movement before the finale. Um, he's to me, this is, I hadn't thought of this until just now, but to me, it's, it's kind of a clear relationship to um, the penultimate Andante reference in the C major Beethoven sonata, because he's looking back to um, the beginning, but actually in a more direct way. So, um, you know, the movements themselves might just, might not be characterizing sonata. The fast movements do character, have a sonata characteristics, but um, these other components, the slow introductions and things like that that are added 
do have this take on a different import. Um, definitely. So yeah, <laughs> I think it's just one of those fluid things. So sure, if we can. Yeah. <laughs> a non-technical question. Oh sure. You mentioned three works for cello that Chopin wrote. I'm familiar with the Sonata and the Polonaise Brillant. Yeah. What is the third work? The third one is, um, and that's actually one that he also collaborated on with his friend, um, and I, I'll butcher his name if I try to pronounce it, but Franchom, I think is. His name, Franchamp. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, excuse my Franchamp. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, it's it's actually a f um, it's basically a fantasy on um, um, Robert the Devil, Meyerbeer's opera um, that was huge. It was pr premiered in 1831, um, made it big in Paris, um, and it's not. He doesn't assign an opus number to it. In fact, I can't remember at what point it was published, but I. I think it was published posthumously. I'm not sure about that, though. Um, but it was it was a piece where he collaborated with the cellist completely, and it was they, they shared. Um, it's actually a fairly effective piece, and this was uh, I mentioned this in the notes. But there's a lot of composers at the time were really quite taken with this uh, grand opera um, uh, that Meyerbeer was producing. Um, one of those people was not Mendelssohn, for instance, <laughs> who uh, thought it was a sham. But um, but there's a lot to it that is actually quite interesting, and the fantasies themselves are really interesting to compare and worth worth checking out. And it's it's a nice piece. It's been recorded uh, several times. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, any other? Oh. <laughs> um, I think, unless I see anybody else, I think we're done. So thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.